Should be set momentarily. Terrific. Oh, I see it's up. It says live. All right, we're we're back, committee. Um, as we had a little longer break than we thought for some IT help, and uh, thank you, IT, for putting us all back together. Um, we're we're gonna. We've heard some testimony this morning on S twenty, and now we're fortunate to have our ledge counsel, Katie McClinn walk through the bill with us. And Katie, as, as we listened to testimony, there were some very specific issues and questions raised. I think uh, as we're going through, uh, maybe help us understand the, the uh, sort of the enforcement or the certificates of compliance sections as we go through each of those sections. And then there is also a rulemaking section uh, related, I think with the Department of Health that might help uh, folks understand the extent of the uh, regulations in the bill. So uh, I guess I, I would just turn it over to you and ask if you, ask you to go through the bill with us. You could we can put it up for us and um, and committee again. I won't be able to see you completely all the time, so you have the authority to interrupt. Nobody else has that authority but you. So <laughs> just uh, you know ask we'll ask Kate, Katie questions as we go along we may get into some dialogue so Katie thank you for being here sure Katie McLean office of legislative council so I'll pull up the document now are you are you seeing the document yes we are perfect great um so I I know you wanted a high level walkthrough and I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because I didn't hear the last two hours of testimony with you so I'll kind of go through and um do the high level overview. And if there's a specific area um, that you heard about this morning that we need to do a little bit of a deeper dive into, just flag that for me as we go through. I think that's the right way to go. Committee, uh, does that sound good to you? Actually, I can see the whole committee. So just shake <laughs> your head, yes or no. Is that okay? Yes. Terrific. All right, let's do it. Okay. So as you know, the bill is divided into five sections and the first section of the bill has to do with the class uh, B firefighting foam. So first we have a new chapter 33 um, specific to firefighting foam and um, there's a definition section. Ordinarily, I, I don't spend a lot of time in walkthroughs going um, through the definition section. So I will keep moving unless um, yeah, I there hear is that one, I should pause. I've, okay. I've, I've, Katie, I failed to mention uh, the number four, intentionally added. So as mm -hmm. we're going through each of these areas where you see intentionally added, it would be helpful to uh, let us know what that means in chemical terms. It's not the same thing as the intent that we deal with when we go through LCAR rules. So, Okay. Yeah. Just, Katie, this is Ruth, just to um, add to what Senator Lyons just said. Um, so this came up in testimony, the difference between intentionally added to a product versus mm -hmm. present in a product. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, sort of in this realm of law, what intent means. Um, obviously there's a different definition of intent when we're talking about criminal law or other law, but what, um, presence versus intent. It, does, does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Um, sort of. I mean, the reason there's a definition of intentionally added is, you know, to try to address that and be specific as to what we mean by intentionally added. The addition of a chemical in a product that serves an intended function and the product component. So um, I, right here, I mean, it's it. the reason for the addition is because it has an intended purpose, an intended function. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question or if this definition if, was feeling unclear to folks. What if, uh, what if there's a, the product, what if PFAS is in something, but it wasn't intentional, <clears throat> excuse me, intentionally added? Would that still be covered under this law? So if there's the firefighting foam has PFAS in it, but it's not quote unquote intentionally added. If it's not intentionally added as defined in subdivision four, then it's outside the scope of the bill. The next section, section 1662, 
is specific um, to foam that intentionally has intentionally added PFAS. Right. So is there, uh, you're not a chemist, but is there a possibility <laughs> that PFAS could be in something when it wasn't intentionally added in the manufacturing process? That's a question I can't answer for you. I mean, uh, so let's think about it. If it, if it's, if it's this product, the foam product and the PFAS comes in a, in a big vat and it's, and it's mixed in as part of the firefighting foam. And it's intentionally there because it serves a purpose of spreading across the fire, then it's intentionally added. But if, if for some reason there's a, a contamination in the water uh, that is being used to produce a firefighting foam, but it's not intentionally added, then it's not intentionally added. I, I don't know how else we can uh, parse that out. I guess I'm just trying to figure out if it's more effective to have intentionally added or present or, or maybe both. <laughs> I don't know, because if it, if it could be there anyway, then doesn't that matter too? <laughs> it, that, go ahead, Senator Hooker. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how do you stop it from being there if it's so omnipresent in the environment, if it's in the water, but not, it wasn't added as an ingredient to this particular uh, product, then I would say that, you know, we can't, I mean, we've been told it's gonna to take 20 or 30 years to get this out of the environment. So how do we, we say that the presence of it only is um, going to trigger this, you know? Yeah, I'm, so I'm inclined to say that, uh, that this seems like an appropriate, um, an appropriate definition and, uh, and very helpful in defining what is in the product. Uh, and I'm, I'm inclined to say that if there's any discussion on this, that we can allow for it to go forward and be more, you know, allow for the house to have some time uh, to, to look at this, but we haven't heard that it's an impediment uh, overall. So that we can come back to it. Let's let's go through and then we'll come back to that. Okay, I'll um, I have a, a hard copy of the bill here, so I'll try to flag items that the committee wants to come sure. back to. Um, okay, so we're moving out of definitions. Um, we're still on firefighting foam. So the 1662. Um, is a prohibition on the discharge or use for training purposes of class B firefighting foam that contains intentionally added PFAS. And then we have restrictions on manufacture, sale, and distribution in the next section. Um, so in subsection A, the manufacturer of foam, um, a manufacturer of foam shall not manufacture, sell, offer for sale, or distribute for sale or use in the state foam in which PFAS have been intentionally added. And subsection B, um, we have a notwithstanding A, any manufacturer, sale, or distribution of the foam um, where inclusion of PFAS is required by federal law. Um, as, um, as the section existed in January 1, 2020 is allowed. And in the event that applicable federal regulations change after that date, to allow the use of alternative firefighting agents that do not contain PFAS, the department is to adopt rules to restrict PFAS for manufacture, sale, and distribution. The next section. Wait, can I ask a question? So there's Go that ahead. federal, the federal um, sort of carve out because there's some apparently instances where the feds require PFAS and firefighting foam for for airplanes or yeah I think it's military yep there it is yeah yep. so that was the question I had Senator Lyons is how does this apply or does it apply to the military particularly the National Guard and their operations in the state um, are they would this bill c cover them or do they get this federal carve out or how does it work if they're using products that have PFAS intentionally added 
My understanding is that the federal government is starting to move away from the use of PFAS, and I don't know where they are in that process yet. Um, and I was hoping that was something that maybe one of the witnesses might have addressed um, while I was out of the room. I'm not sure if you if you heard anything about the federal government starting to move away from the use, um, but I can um, look into that and try to get back to you as to whether um, National Guard um, duties would be impacted by this. Uh, well, yeah, whether if, they would be required to follow this bill. If we if this passes into law, would that would it cover their operations as well, Katie? Okay. They 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 would be covered by the federal government. Although we do know that right now there is PFAS in the Winooski River that may well be the result of the use of PFAS at the Burlington Airport. So the so we would not be regulating any federally regulated uh, aircraft or rescue and firefighting equipment, period. And I, so, uh, Katie, unless you find differently, I believe that the Air Guard and others would be exempt from what we're doing here. I, I think that's true. My question is to what exempt, to what extent okay. has the federal government started to move away from these practices altogether? Oh, and okay. um, it, it makes me, because this language has been introduced for over a few bienniums, it makes me wonder the extent to which this language would still be needed if indeed the federal government has moved um, away from the practice of using PFAS and class B foam. So um, let me flag it and get you an answer. Okay. Terrific. Right, and if the guard is doing things in other parts of the state and there are other places that are not involving aircraft, would this bill cover them? I mean, I would like it to. So that's the question is, is does it, it, are there instances where the guard would be subject to this regulation if it were to pass into law? Okay. Thank you. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be except where the federal government has put um, regulations in place, except where they're making these exemptions? I mean, it seems to me that they'd be um, held to the law except for those exemptions. And right, maybe they would be. I don't know. That's the, that's my question, I guess. Okay, so I have that flagged. We'll try to get some resolution on that piece. Um, the next section is 1664. Um, we're moving to personal protective equipment containing PFAS. Um, so in this section, the manufacturer or a person sell, um, selling the equipment to a person, municipality, or state agency is to provide written notice to the purchaser at the time of sale if the PPE contains PFAS. And the written notice is to include a statement that the PPE contains PFAS and the reason um, PFAS are added to the equipment. So what's the function of the PFAS and the equipment? And subsection B, the manufacturer or person selling the PPE and the purchaser of the PPE shall retain the notice for at least three years from the date of transaction. And then at the request of the Department of Health, the person, manufacturer, or purchaser is to furnish that notice or written copies um, and associated sales documentation to the department within 60 days. In 1665, we have the, the recall and notification provisions. So a manufacturer of foam um, is prohibited, who's um, prohibited under 1663 um, of selling um, or distributing or manufacturing foam, um, shall notify in writing um, all persons that sell the product in the state about the provisions of this chapter, not less than one year prior to the effective date of the restrictions. And a manufacturer that produces, sells, distributes the foam that's prohibited under section 1663 is to recall the product and reimburse the retailer or any purchaser of the product. And so we have, just as a reminder, this section, I believe doesn't take effect this July 1, 2022. Um, so for, for foam and for the chemicals of high concern, our effective date is a, a year and a half out, July 1, 2022. 
And then we have the certificate of compliance piece. And I believe this is, there are some questions here. So um, under subsection A, the department is, may request a certificate of compliance from a manufacturer of foam or um, of the PPE. And the certificate of compliance is to attest that the manufacturer's product or products meet the requirements of the chapter. And on um, subsection B, the department shall assist other state agencies and municipalities to avoid purchasing or using class B foam to which PFAS have been intentionally added. And the department is to assist other state agencies, town fire districts, and other municipalities to give priority and preference to the purchase of PPE that does not contain PFAS. Was there okay. a question there that? No, I, the, the, no. no just okay. to make sure that we uh, hit that uh, certificate of compliance section. Yes. So people, because so, there were questions about sort of enforcement and how do we keep track? Mm -hmm. Okay. And next we have a penalty section. Um, and it states that it's a violation of the chapter um, will be deemed a violation of the Consumer Protection Act and the AG has the same authority to make rules, conduct civil investigations and enter into assurances of discontinuance and bring civil actions and private parties have the same right and remedies as are provided under the Consumer Protection Act. And then we move that. And I actually have had a conversation with uh, AG, the AG's office, and they're, 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 they have continue to support uh, their role in this. So we're moving now out of um, firefighting foam and we're moving to the food packaging piece. Wait, Katie, before you do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to reconcile the two section or the various sections. So the manufacturer sale and distribution of, of foam, firefighting foam with PFAS is restricted or prohibited. And in order to ensure that local fire departments, quote unquote, don't get in trouble, the department is going to assist them in trying to find foam that they can purchase that doesn't have PFAS. Is that the basics? I don't know if the point is so so they don't get in trouble, but I think they're providing their assistance in in, in finding foam that um, doesn't contain intentionally added PFAS. Well, so they don't get in trouble and so that the firefighters aren't exposed to PFAS. I mean, this sure. sort of both like we, you know, we don't want them to violate our new law and we don't want firefighters to be exposed to this toxic chemical. So it's sort of a dual purpose in providing assistance to fire, for, to state and municipal firefighting agencies. Is that a fair interpretation? I, yes, I think it's fair okay. to say that they're, they're providing assistance. Okay, thank you. Is it okay for me to move on to the, away, away from the firefighting foam and move on to the next? Section? Okay. Unless you hear someone uh, speaking up. We're, Just we're keep good. moving. Okay. Yeah. Um, so next we have the food packaging section and this um, is not specific to PFAS. It, it applies to three different um, chemical groups. So we have PFAS, phthalates, and bisphenols. Um, the first section is a definition section. Um, so I'm not going to pause here unless I hear otherwise. Well, I do have a, <laughs> Katie, it's, it's Ruth again, <laughs> a question about the definition of bisphenols. Is this already in statute somewhere? This definition is just being repeated here? I'm not sure. I know there was a bill on bisphenols and I don't know if it was pulled from that. I would have to double check to see if they are, if they match. <clears throat> okay. Cause we did hear some testimony about concerns about this definition and I'm not a chemist, so I don't want to presume anything about it, but I'm just wondering if we could check to make sure that this is a- I, I think it might be in the chemicals. <laughs> I think it is the, is, uh, would be in the chemicals of high concern for children section. Um, 
I think the BPA definition has been there for a while, but um, Katie would be helpful to have confirmation of that. Sure, that's that's very easy to check. As soon as I'm yeah. done doing the walkthrough and not sharing my screen, I'll, I'll jump over and do that. That's easy. Yeah, okay. Hey, uh, Katie, it's Josh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, so uh, at this section, um, <clears throat> this is where we had a brief conversation offline in reference to this West Rock uh, letter from the West Rock Sheldon Springs business. Um, and their concerns are around uh, the definitions of um, PFAS in this bill, I guess more specifically in this section because they deal with food packaging. Um, I guess I posed this question to the committee. Is there a way for us to uh, include this portion, but um, broaden uh, or narrow the scope of the definition to be acceptable to a large business like West Rock while maintaining the safety and integrity of the bill? Senator, could I just ask for clarification? Are, are you, you're looking specifically at the definition of PFAS in this section? Or are you? Yes. So I'm looking at the West Rock letter and their concern is uh, they're saying the definition of PFAS is overly broad and would ban all materials that share any chemical properties with PFAS. So um, in regards to food packaging, so I guess I bring this up because we're in the definition sections of food packaging. And that again is why I bring up to my colleagues on the committee as to, is there a way that we can make this definition more acceptable to everyone involved, including this business, which is concerned about their future if this bill passes? Well, uh, you're asking a, a really uh, a question I think that we've heard before and, and that, that it's been raised regarding the definition of PFAS because it is such an extensive group of chemicals uh, with similar properties. So um, I'm, how much time do you have? I, I, it, will take, it will take significant work to be able to parse out all the chemicals. And so I'm, I don't know that this, um, this can be done. We also heard, we have heard from others that restricting and trying to limit the definition of PFAS would uh, probably not be helpful in terms of uh, food packaging, but we'll, we'll, we've got that question, Senator. It's a, I think it's gonna be a, a question that goes on for a long period of time. So okay. just for clarity, Senator Terenzini or Katie, um, the definition that is used in section two, the food packaging of PFAS is the one that's on page three of the bill. Is that yeah, that was, my, that was my confusion. So we use the same definition of PFAS mm -hmm. for, throughout. And so you see we're in section two of the bill here and we're just cross-referencing the earlier definition of PFAS. If it's helpful for the committee, I can scroll up so you can all see the definition. It's and under it, 1661. And I think one of the things that we heard in testimony is because PFAS can, is, covers hundreds of chemicals, um, addressing it as a class of chemicals is more effective. And, and that may be uh, Senator Terenzini, what that West Rock or whatever the company's name is, is concerned about because it's a class definition rather than an individual chemical definition. But because there are so many chemicals, doing it as an individual chemical um, definition is really difficult. <laughs> well, at least that's my understanding of the situation. If not I, impossible. I, I I appreciate um, your help on that, Senator Hardy. I, um, and I don't pretend to be an expert in this. I'm not a chemist and I can understand the complexities of this. I, I too um, very much uh, support um, many of the pieces of this bill, but I am also sensitive to this large employer of Vermont who seems to have some serious concerns about this and the uh, negative effects it's going to have on their business. So anyways, thank you, Senator Lyons for allowing me to, take five minutes. Yeah, well, you know, no, the other thing is that we're hearing that there are uh, alternative chemicals uh, for some of the, for, for industry and uh, this, this may 
actually spur some uh, improvements overall. Remembering, of course, I do know, I'm very familiar with West Rock. Uh, we dealt with them on some uh, weatherization issues a couple of years ago in finance. And they are, um, you know, they're, they're making cardboard packaging. So however, whatever the transition is, it may be that they are not, uh, that they don't die because of PFAS. We've seen in the past concerns from, from large businesses, and yet they seem to accommodate and find alternatives. So we'll just, we'll, we'll keep that on the, on the front, hoping Thank they you. can succeed. Yeah. Go ahead, Katie. Okay, I'm scrolling back down to section two. Um, so we were in the food packet, the definition for the food packaging section talked about the cross-reference um, to PFAS and all the other sections. And then we um, move on to the language. So in subsection A, this section um, is specific to PFAS. A manufacturer, supplier, distributor shall not manufacture, sell, or offer for sale, distribute for sale, or distribute for your use in this state a food package that contains PFAS um, intentionally added in any amount. And then in subsection B, we move on to discuss bisphenols. So um, pursuant to our rule, to um, our section on rulemaking, the Department of Health may adopt rules prohibiting a manufacturer, supplier, distributor from selling or offering for sale or for promotional distribution, a food package or the packaging component of a food package to which bisphenols have been intentionally added in any amount greater than an incidental presence. So this is not a, a prohibition. This is authority to adopt rules if the department chooses. Um, and then in subdivision one, the department may only prohibit a manufacturer, supplier, distributor from selling or offering for sale or for promotional distribution of food package or the packaging component of a food package in accordance with the subsection if the department has determined that a safer alternative is readily available in sufficient quantity and at comparable cost, and that the safer alternative performs as well or is better than the bisphenol in a specific application. So that's criteria that has to be met before the department can adopt rules. And then in subsection two, if the department prohibits a manufacturer, supplier, distributor from selling or offering for sale or for promotional distribution of food package or packaging component, in accordance with the subsection, the prohibition is not to take effect until two years after the department deter determines that a safer alternative is available. So that sets a timeline for when that prohibition could take effect if rulemaking is pursued. The last piece here um, has to do um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, so now we're, we're, we're moving on again, and we're looking at um, packages that include inks, dyes, pigment, pigments, adhesives, stabilizers, coatings, plasticizers, or any other additives into, to which phthalates have been intentionally added in a greater, an amount greater than an incidental presence. So um, we've moved on, we've covered PFAS and A, and B, we've covered bisphenols, and C, we're covering phthalates, and like in subsection A, this is prohibiting um, the manufacturer um, sale or offer for sale, distributing for sale or distributing for use of these products. Um, and then in subsection D, this is language that you'll see throughout the different parts, but um, this section is not to apply to the um, sale or resale of used products. Um, and this was added, I believe on the floor, um, when the bill moved through during the last biennium to acknowledge that, um, for example, somebody who's selling a product um, secondhand might not know the whole history of the product or what went into um, the manufacture of the product. And then we have the certificate of compliance language um, that is um, a variation of what you saw in the previous section, but the manufacturer that is subject to prohibitions under this chapter on food packaging is to develop a certificate of compliance and that the certificate is to attest 
that the manufacturer's um, product or products meet the requirements of the chapter and that the department could request such a certificate from the manufacturer um, and the manufacturer shall provide that within 30 calendar days after the request is made. And then there is rulemaking authority here that the Commissioner of Health is to adopt any rules necessary for the implementation, administration and enforcement of the chapter. Next, we're moving on from food packaging to rugs, carpets, and aftermarket stain and water resistant treatments. Um, so again, we have a definition section. I'm gonna move through that and move to 1682. And subsection A, the manufacturer, supplier, distributor shall not manufacture, sell, or offer for sale, distribute for sale, or distribute for use in this state a residential rug or carpet to which PFAS have been intentionally added. And again, this section is not to apply to the sale or resale of products. And then there's um, a section on aftermarket stain and water resistant treatments. And that um, is that a manufacturer, supplier, distributor is not to manufacture, sell, or offer for sale, distribute for sale, or distribute for use um, aftermarket stain and water resistant treatments for rugs or carpets to which PFAS have been intentionally added and any amount and that this section is not to apply to sale or resale of used products. The certificate of compliance language is the, in, excuse me, is the same as the previous section that we just looked at. And similarly, the rulemaking authority is the same as in the section we just reviewed. The next section of the bill has to do with ski wax. Again, we have a definition section and then we have, um, the language in 1692 that states that a manufacturer, supplier, distributor is not to manufacture, sell, offer for sale, distribute for sale, or distribute for use in the state ski wax or related tuning products to which PFAS have been intentionally added. Again, this does not apply to sale or resale of used products. The certificate of compliance is identical to the language we looked at in the previous chapter, as is the rulemaking authority. And then we get to um, the language on chemicals of high concern to children. And um, as you know, this existing um, section of law lists various chemicals on the official list of chemicals of high concern to children because um, the proposal is to add PFAS, which is a class of chemicals. The lead in language has changed to read the chemicals or a member of a class of chemicals. And then um, PFAS is added um, to that list in um, subsection 67. And then we've renumbered. Yep. So that's what I, I had a question about that, that language in paragraph A. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're trying to add PFAS as a, as a class of chemicals, and we just had that little brief discussion about that. But mm -hmm. so we had some testimony with concern about this section. Does this language could it potentially mean that the other chemicals that are already on this list would, um, like I, I was looking at the list, you know, like uh, styrene, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know, but that, that, that this could be interpreted that the whole class of chemicals to which styrene um, belongs to would then be on this list. Um, I, I don't know that I would agree with that reading. I'm looking at 67, the new language, and this is the only place where it specifies that it's a class. Um, the class, do you, do you see on line 19, um, perfluoral alkyl, polyfluoral alkyl substances, the class for fluorinated organic chemicals. So yeah. I think that because it's specifying a class here that we're referring back in the introductory language to where it's saying a member of a class of chemicals. But if it's just one chemical listed, I don't, I don't read that to mean that we would be referring to the whole class of chemicals if it's just that one chemical listed. Okay. I think there was just a concern that it could be interpreted as being overly broad when you're just looking at the statutes, not the website. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm looking at the website now and it does have the list of all the chemicals clearly. That, but. Okay, that's in statute also. Um, I mean, we have one through 66 that are omitted here in the bill and we just have 
um, the ellipses to represent the fact that that's been omitted. But the statue okay. has each individual chemical listed. It does. And class okay. is the only place where it says class. Okay. It's so it, it is art. They are, if they're already listed in statute, I thought there was only a list on this sort of separate website that, so it may be confusing for whether or not they're a class of chemicals or an individual chemical. No, and I can stop sharing this and pull up the statue, but the statue, um, I mean, these ellipses mean that language was omitted. So we have a list here of, of 66 chemicals that are listed. And if it's helpful to the committee, I could pull that up so we could look at it. No, that's when we okay. For, yeah, I just, just let me interject here a little bit. Um, when we passed the first chemicals of high concern for children, uh, uh, children's products, uh, we inserted the, the initial list of 66 and then it, it's been added to, um, the Department of Health can add by rule can add also. So th there might be, a, a, a there could be a, a slight difference, um, but it's there, it's, it's all part of the same program ultimately. If you felt the need to be, to add clarity, one thought would be to say, um, so I'm looking at lines 15 and 16 of the bill the following chemicals or a member of a listed class of chemicals to make clear that um, it would have to be that the class is listed and the only one that is listed is 67. I'm not sure that that's necessary, but maybe that would. I, you know, I think, uh, uh, frankly, I think manufacturers understand their responsibilities with respect to this. Um, it's been around long enough and the Department of Health certainly uh, provides guidance for manufacturers, and so I, I think, I think it's not an, I think it's not probably something that is absolutely necessary for clarity's sake. That's my opinion. I, I mean, I think it's helpful that it says specifically that it's listed. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not gonna, I'm not gonna battle the chair on this one, Ginny. But I, uh, I, I wouldn't. So it's I, fine, listen, it's fine either it, way. I just, you know, this yeah. was a concern that sort of made sense to me, and I wanted to bring it up. If you think it's clear, Katie, as the as a lawyer, then that's helpful. Um, because ultimately it's lawyers who are looking at this to determine what the list is. And then, then the, um, the, the, the website is where the, the manufacturers would be looking at to find what specific chemicals are listed. So it says the following chemicals or a member of a class of chemicals, and then when you go through the list, the only place you're going to see the class for the class four is right next to fluorinated organic organic chemicals or fluorophyll alcohol uh, substances. So I think it's clear. I don't know how how to clarify it further. What do you think, Cheryl? Anyway. I'm thinking that as long as it's specified in the statute that it should be clear enough. I mean, the list is individual chemicals and then you get to PFAS and then it says something about class next to it. Is that what I'm understanding? It's going to be added to the list. So it seems yes. that, that would be the only one with a class next to it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then we get to the effective dates of the bill. And as I noted earlier, um, well, the act takes effect on July 1, 2021, not all of the sections take effect um, this, this year. Um, so sections one and five, so firefighting, foam and chemicals of high concern to children take effect uh, July 1, 2022. And then the food packaging, rugs and carpets and ski wax sections take effect on um, July 1, 2023. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, committee, what, where would you like to go now that we have Katie here uh, for, to, 
further clarify the questions that you have. I'm gonna look up that bisphenols question right now while yeah, you're okay. chatting. That would be good. And also the, the, um, the federal uh, CFR, the rules at the federal level on PFAS foam, firefighting foam. <clears throat> I guess I have a question of if we ban PFAS and the use of that in firefighting foam, except for the federal exemptions, then, you know, how does it, you know, how do our firefighters get this? I mean, is it supplied by the federal government? Is it, you know, how does it get into the state if we, if we've banned it? That's a question for Katie. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what can you, can you restate your question, please? Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about the exemption, the federal um, exemptions, you know, for the, the firefighting foam that's used for certain cases. Yeah. Uh, if we ban it, then I'm not sure. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where does it come from for use for these instances that it's been allowed it's just a pretty basic question i think i guess i'm not totally following the question i'm uh, sorry so <laughs> okay how do we get the, the the stuff that is allowable by the federal government if we've banned it in the state Be, um oh. so you're you're creating a carve out for applicable federal law so you wouldn't be stopping something that's allowed by federal law that would still be authorized. We could buy it from other states or wherever, you know, we don't manufacture it. It's okay to just bring it in and use it for those purposes. I mean, that's, it's. As the bill's written now, yes. It's, I think Cheryl, it's mostly for like airplane mm -hmm. fires is my understanding. So like the, the, the airports would have it. Um, yep. And presumably they would fly it in on their planes. <laughs> and yeah. you asked about the military and that. Right. And you know. so, yeah, I, I'm curious about that. I'm mean, presumably the uh, air guard would have it for their use, but would this also, could this apply to the national guard for other purposes that we would not want them to be using the PFAS for because it's, and you know, potentially dangerous to their members. So, and according to this law, then Katie, it would not be allowed. It would only be allowed for those things that are allowable under the federal ruling. Correct. Otherwise, right. it wouldn't be allowable right. in the state. Right. Um, also, I've just been looking at this bisphenol question. Is there another place where it's defined? There is another place where bisphenol A is defined, 18 VSA 1512. But it doesn't, um, let's see, it means an industrial chemical used primarily in the manufacture of the polycarbonate plastic and epoxy resins. So we're defining bisphenols in this bill the same way bisphenol A is um, defined in 1512. So I'm not sure, um, I'm not a chemist. So I'm not sure well, if it's BPA they, is BPA. So bisphenol A is what is defined. defined. Yeah. And, and that was, we did that a long time ago. Uh, I, I remember exactly maybe 10 or 12 years ago uh, in statute. And that's the definition that we've been using, I think, consistently. Okay. So those, those do align what's in existing law and what's in the bill. What's okay. the statute, the statutory citation, Katie? 18 VSA 1512. Okay, thanks. All right. Anything else, committee, that you want to go through again? It looks like Josh has his hand up. There you go. I uh, I did have my hand up, but you know I might be opening another can of worms here, and, and uh, 
I and I don't intend to do that, but this is a lot of this is a lot of stuff that we've taken on today. And uh, I understand probably the intention is to vote on this before crossover so the House can take it up. But um, if if you just allow me for a moment to go back to page three uh, yep. under that definition, line six, uh, under let, the definition. Let, let, of, we'll get, let us get there. Yeah, sorry. OK, de, uh, line six. So, uh, yeah, so the, we're in the definition of PFAS. And, and so the part that I'm stuck on a bit is it says, or a chemical compound meant to replace PFAS and other substances with similar chemical properties. My very brief understanding uh, is that some of the alternatives that these companies would use would be much healthier uh, and much safer for the environment, but could have one small variation or definable particle that could could really get them in trouble if we use such a such a broad definition of PFAS or a chemical component meant to replace. Uh, is there any interest in removing those few words or a chemical component meant to replace? Well, the, when you look at the, um, I think the replacement relates to uh, fluorinated compounds or compounds that are uh, bioactive, have the similar proper properties, may expand through the environment, bioaccumulative, bioactive. So, so the similar um, chemical and biological properties, environmental properties of the compound. I think that's the that's the that's the issue. So when when chemicals, the, the companies that build these chemicals can just change one uh, atom or molecule and make it appear to be different, but may have the same properties and effect environmentally and biologically. And so that's the that that's the concern there. That was it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so I am a chemist, so I do I do understand so, a little bit about it. Not you know not a whole lot, but you know, Senator Hooker. Good. Yes, Senator Lyons. I'm going to appeal to your chemistry. Um, so can uh -oh, you but tell? I may not answer it. Well, no, I'm, you <laughs> know, I'm not I, the expert I'm not, testifying. I am not a chemist, um, but PFAs, bisphenols, and phthalates are all fluorinate. Um, fluoride. No. Okay. No. So, no. okay. So, um, if we're looking at PFAs, then, and we talk about the class of chemicals, is that that they're fluoridated chemicals? Fluoridated, fluoridated hydrocarbons? Probably. Hydrocarbons. Okay. So, the bisphenols and the others are not fluoridated. Other well, different chemical compounds, and they have different chemical structures. Okay, so and, if, and they may uh, and they may have they have slightly different properties. They do different things in uh, in uh, product manufacturing. Okay, all right. Well, that helps. So you know, and and one of the, like phthalates you find in shampoos and conditioners and things. Uh, they're softeners, and they're used as softeners, perhaps in a plastic container, whereas a BPA might be is slightly different. Might be used to uh, firm up a, a container, so they're, they're very different um, qualities. Different. And they would still be allowed. 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 I, I don't know what question you're asking. They would still be allowed in to be sold. Products with these types of chemicals are still allowed mm -hmm. under the law, and it's just the fluorinated hydrocarbons or whatever is that in the uh, I are you talking you're talking about this section that Senator Terenzini took us to on PFAs uh, on firefighting foam um not so much a firefighting foam I guess I've moved on to food packaging and and the like okay so let's the questions or one of the comments was that uh, before about the bisphenols um you know there was some question about whether or not um, 
exposure to these in food packaging was safe. And it seems that, you know, they had been studied and found that it was safe. My question was, is there a cumulative exposure that could be a problem? But, um, but that there are not high levels of these chemicals in food packaging. Is this going to affect food packaging that has BPAs in it? What is your question? Where are you in the bill? Um, seriously. In the food packaging part. Yes. Yeah, we're there. Okay. So, I don't know. So it has been identified that in, in food packaging that quantities of, of, say, BPA or phthalate might leach out of the package and into the food. And that... Uh, in different studies, it's been demonstrated that 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 can, those chemicals could have an effect, a biological effect, okay, and they so can bioaccumulate and have effect over time. So that's a concern, and that, so there are there are studies about with people uh, demonstrating some neurological changes. I think who testified on that? I think Jen Duggan testified a little bit on the mm -hmm. health effects. So, okay. so I guess, yeah. you know, this is like Senator Terenzini says, this is a lot of information. And it's the first time I'm, yeah. I'm seeing this. So, yeah. you know, the goal of this law is to get rid of these things that are creating health problems and environmental problems. And it includes all of these things, PFAS, BPAs. Right. But it's, you know, each, each chemical in its own place. So the PFAs are used in firefighting foam. Mm -hmm. They're used uh, as we heard on rugs and carpets. Uh, and we've also heard that the, that there are some large uh, companies that are eliminating the use of PFAS in their rugs and carpets, you know, like, uh, what did we hear at Home Depot and some others. And then we've heard that there are some problems with the use of BPA or phthalates in, uh, in food packaging. And so they've become suspect in terms of causing health problems. And again, many companies are are steering away from packaging that includes those um, chemicals. So companies like Walmart and others, the, the whole list that we saw. So um, each of the chemicals that we're looking at, it, we're, we're addressing a number of chemicals that may have significant health effects. And so trying to limit exposure human exposure to those by limiting where where they are in specific products. So if you take each section of the bill separately, then you look at PFAS and that's as uh, important for firefighters and their equipment as well as the use of foam. And then if you, and then look at PFAS in terms of some consumer products like drugs that leach out or release PFAS into the air or into the environment can have an effect. And then you go and look at food packaging and that those, the chemicals that we've looked at are like BPA or phthalates or PFAS are used in packaging. And again, they can um, have an effect, a biological effect a on, on people oh, when we're exposed. And then we also heard from, uh, let's see, what else? I think, you know, it, and then the ski wax is similarly with, with PFAS being released into the environment and having a, an effect. I, you know, th and think about the, the really difficult situation that occurred in Bennington with the contamination uh, of groundwater contamination with PFAS. We don't wanna see that replicated across the state. Uh, but it's really harder to see, <clears throat> it's so much harder to see, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 
BPA and phthalates because they're to total, totally invisible to us, but they're there. So it make, makes it hard and, and it is complex, no question about it. Anyway, go ahead, Ruth. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, I know that, that we wanna try to get this bill out tomorrow, um, but I'm wondering if there's a possibility we could um, get a chemist to come in and, and help that's not, does not work for the industry and doesn't have a skin in this game who might have, or except for understanding the chemistry, who might be able to talk to us about these definitions. Cause I think I've heard, you know, Senator Terenzini has a question about a definition, Sh Senator Hooker does, I did. And it might be helpful to see if we can get some just pure like academic toxicologist chemist who could come in and, and help us with the definition. And so we could ask these questions um, and know, you know, we heard- Well, we can do, we can people, try that. Fine, uh, we, but, we can, you know, having yep. a, just a, that might be helpful. I just texted somebody I know to see if she might be available, but um, uh, there, there may be others as well. As long as it's someone who's familiar with these chemicals and, and the research base, I mean, it's different, uh, there are significantly different interests on the part of um, chemists, whether they're organic, biologic, uh, biochemists, physical chemists, you know, they each have a different perspective. Yes, so, yes. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do uh, for that. We could also ask our um, state epidemiologist, Sarah Vos, to come in. Uh, perhaps she would be the a person who could give us some uh, disinterested and objective information. Yeah, whoever at Department available. of Health deals with this area may be appropriate as well, yeah. So yes, there are epidemiologists and toxicologists involved with the working group for children's uh, chemicals of concern. So we'll, we'll see what we can do. We can't, I know it's, um, we'll, we'll try to do that. And, and just another kind of basic thing. I mean, I'm curious to know what other alternatives are there? You know, what are some of the things that are used to, to replace the use of PFAS? And maybe Mr. Wolf could talk about that with seventh generation and what they use. And um, I, you know, I think some of the testimony that we've gotten, if you look at it, there's, there's been a lot that people have given us. So maybe take a minute to look at that. And then um, we'll see if Martin Wolf is available to come in again Thank to you. talk. He's not here right now. All right. Anything else? All right. We've got 18 minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the people who are here with us, uh, who are, have their names up. Um, is there anyone here? Uh, I shouldn't be, I better be careful what I wish for, but, um, so, uh, Lauren, you've had a lot of experience with this and Marcy, you, uh, or Jen, you have as well in terms of linking up with various, um, chemists in the who are not affiliated with a specific uh, company or organization. Let's start with that one. Uh, we'll go with that and then we'll ask about the uh, alternative uh, chemicals that might be used. I mean, one thing I'm happy to do um, because numerous states have uh, put in place very similar laws, um, I could try to compile for you all right now just examples of how New York, Maine, Washington have defined PFAS. Just you know, make sure that we're synced up with how other states are doing it. I think that should be relatively straightforward. I think the crux of what's in our definition is um, is that chemical definition. Um, but knowing those other states are now ahead of us and have been actually implementing those laws for a couple of years without problem, I think. Why don't I work on that right now? Does that seem helpful? Yeah, that would be helpful. I, uh, Ruth, would that help you? Senator Hardy, would that help you? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Um, All right. 
And and then in terms of um, replacement chemicals, Lauren, do you so, have? A yeah, I mean, I I think like what we Martin. just want to make sure is the definition is encapsulating the class, as you were saying, which I think is how the wording is, and I you know I I understand the confusion that some folks might have if you're somehow saying it's like, you know, any alternative chemical. Um, the way I read it is trying to get at that class approach. Um, but we can see- I'm thinking of that, substitutions. Yeah. Yeah, replacement replacements for what's currently being used. Oh, Apparently, oh yeah, there's- uh, Yeah. I, I believe there should be submitted and I'll double check, um, but there are quite a few studies to Senator Hooker's question around um, there's reams of studies around like, you know, so for example, I think it was like 46% or something of uh, food packaging studied contained fluorinated compounds, um, which demonstrate the presence of PFAS and you go sector by sector and there are, um, you know, some pizza boxes have use PFAS, some don't, um, some, you know, so you go through the different product categories and you can use PFAS or not and still have, you know, a cost competitive and different companies use them or not. So um, th this is where, you know, the, a lot of the retailers and stuff have pledged to move away from it because you, you can perfectly do your job, do, do the thing which you're trying to do, which is contain the food um, without using these chemicals. So um, I believe that there was a Center for Environmental Health um, study submitted, um, but I'll make sure that because it just lays out really clearly a whole bunch of the examples of different ways you can achieve the same packaging for, for food. And that would be good because I know like Erin Segrist mentioned, you know, disrupting the supply chain because we couldn't get the things that were packaged without PFAS. So, but, um, you know, that's certainly a we, we saw what happened at the beginning of the pandemic, although we also saw how we pivoted very quickly to go to something else when we couldn't get what we were used to. And I, I would yeah. just note yeah. too that um, in my testimony and another's testimony, there are lists for each of the products that are covered in the bill, <clears throat> where the alternatives are, which companies um, have transitioned and links to all of those materials just to demonstrate that there are safe alternatives for all of the products that are covered in the bill. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Bill, your, Bill Driscoll uh, turned on, so go, go ahead. Oh, Madam Chair, I very much appreciate uh, noticing that. Um, so I would just, just add some considerations in, in these follow-up. Uh, questions, which I think are important for the committee to be looking at. Um, two things. One, the definition of PFAS that includes alternative chemicals, those are it's important to keep in mind that includes any, chemo any chemical similarity. So it is not linked to health concerns with alternatives. So I think it's important to factor that into the problems or challenges with that definition that we cited before. And with regard to assessing the whether there are whether there are alternatives, I think it's important to keep in mind, and I think it's instructive to look at the language in the bill already for the potential banning of bisphenols in food packaging, where that includes a consideration of the availability, affordability, and effectiveness of alternatives, and those are three important factors to keep in mind when you're assessing um, the state of alternatives and how that might affect whether something is banned or even just the timing of whether it's banned. All right, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> um, all right, and so what, what's difficult to do, of course, and I think what the state of Maine did do a few years ago uh, was to invest um, a quarter of a million dollars in an analysis of the effect, the health effects and health costs related to some of these chemicals. So it, 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 there's costs on both ends, uh, both sides of this that uh, we wanna consider. Um, all right, committee, any other questions? Um, so we'll, we will look at the information that we have on alternative products. Uh, Lauren Hurl is going to provide us with definitions from other states so we can see how 
we line up with those and that should answer some of the questions that we've heard about um, the chemical uh, chemical definitions. Uh, so it, if you don't mind uh, sending that information to uh, Nellie and to me and to Nellie and to Katie and make sure that uh, we're copied on that and we'll get that posted so the whole committee can see it. Um, Anything else, committee? We'll come back to this tomorrow, obviously. Um, if I can just find my agenda. Nothing is ever simple. Yeah, so tomorrow we'll come back to this. Um, as early in the day as we can and uh, finish up some discussion and see where we land. Okay, so we've got, we've got, we can do a little bit of reading in between and uh, thinking. Katie, are we, are we, are we all set? Are you, you were going to bring us um, what? Or did we, we haven't it? asked for any changes? Okay. We don't have any. I don't think, I, 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 unless there's a real burning and intent, uh, intensive need to make uh, specific changes. Um, I'm looking at Senator Hardy because you brought up the list and you really wanted that. I mean, would that improve the bill significantly? and moving it forward. Is there, are there any changes that folks would like to make at this point? What do you uh, mean we, the list? The, that, the, you, oh, the language about the yeah, class? Yeah, the, the language, the yeah. I mean, yeah, the class. I, I, I think it would make it clearer, but um, I, I, I don't need to have that in there to, to vote for the bill. Um, okay. I, I am, um, I still would like a little bit more testimony on the definitions. So I'm okay. So will and that and that the definitions. Can we look at the? What is it helpful for you to have the definitions that other states are using? Would that be um, reassuring enough? Um, uh, potentially. Useful? I mean, I'll I'll definitely look at Lauren's stuff. I and um, I appreciate and respect her work very much. So, um, uh, but I also just, I'm going to do a little digging myself. So um, I All will right. um, see what I come up with. <laughs> All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, Senator Terenzini. I uh, sound like a broken record, Senator Lyons, but you know, I, I really, I keep coming back to this letter we received from this large business and I'm hoping tomorrow with, with additional testimony, possibly from a chemist or an expert in the field that I can feel a little bit more comfortable about voting for this bill. And, and maybe there can be uh, different definitions put in the bill that would define alternatives that a company like this could use, for example, or what is a PF, PFSA or not. And so anyways, that's, that's, um, sort of my thought process the worst thing that could happen in my mind is we pass something like this and then we find out come july 1st that this company is laying off people because they don't have an alternative and you know we put them we put them out of business and and i might be sounding dramatic but that's how i'm thinking here as i make this decision that i don't yeah, I want to think I about the health and environment but i don't want to also hurt businesses so i think we need to strike a balance right we we hear you and um so I, I can't promise that we'll have a chemist available to come in to, to, to talk with us. We will look at the definitions that we have from other states and hope that is, as I said before, uh, somewhat reassuring uh, or demand change. And uh, also knowing that um, we understand, I guess what I understand about West Rock is that they produce a lot of pack, uh, cardboard packaging. So. And we have heard that there may be alternatives, that there are alternatives for that. So let's look through the alternative list. Um, 
I think that uh, Jen Duggan has put up for us or possibly, uh, yeah, I think, so we'll look at that. Take some time to look through the information. Um, all right. Senator Hooker, anything? <laughs> no. Uh, I think I'm getting there. I don't know. We're get takes Just time. Want to uh, understand? Uh, yeah, what I know. Implications are. Yeah, it takes time. All right, um, Katie, we're good for now. Uh, we'll come back to this tomorrow morning. All right, committee, we're five minutes early. Um, that, that's probably a good thing. I think there's a lot for us to go through and to read and to uh, digest. So we'll we'll do that. We'll take we'll take our five minutes, and we have we'll take some time between now and tomorrow morning uh, to, to look at what we've got. And um, you know, thank you for your good attention today. You've done a lot of a lot of thinking. This is not easy. I greatly appreciate that. Um, but we'll you know we'll we'll keep going. Thank you. We're we're good. Nellie, we can go off YouTube.